I needed and wanted to be with Jeff, my long distance partner at that moment, to hold him, to have him hold me when I was in such pain and he wasn't there. Hi, this is Mike Balaban. Welcome to another episode of Bammer Talks. Before I get started, I'd like to ask those of you watching who haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube page, please do so. We're a very small channel and every little bit of support helps. Thank you. Also, like if you like it, uh, submit comments, and if you have any suggestions for future top topics, I'd appreciate hearing from you about them. Today, I'd like to cover the subject of long distance dating and long distance relationships, uh, which is a pretty complicated issue and it's kind of hard to get your, wrap your arms around it. But, you know, I've had my share of long distance dating and um, I had one particular success with it, but a number of, uh, I guess, abortive attempts. You know, it's very hard when you're 20, 25 and 30 and you're first experiencing dating and emotions and affection and love to recognize whether an incipient relationship is real and if you both are on the same page, or if it's simply an affair or a fling with one side maybe caring more than the other. Eventually that works itself out and you, you learn from your experience. Uh, by the time I was in my late 40s, I had not had any long-term relationships. I'd only had uh, I'm sorry, long-term relationships that were through long-term dating. I'd only had those that I met first in person and we lived near each other. I went to Fort Lauderdale on vacation over Christmas, New Year's. And there I met a really good looking, muscular, bright, funny guy from the Detroit area who was also on vacation with his friends. And on our final night in the same town, we ended up in bed together. And then I had to leave the next day. And there was something about him, an aura, and I couldn't forget him. When, when we separated and I flew back to New York, I kept thinking about him. And I initiated emailing him and then calling, and we started communicating on a regular basis. And within a few weeks, recognized we were both interested and wanted to get together. Now, we were lucky. I was self-employed as a consultant, so I could fly out to visit him if I felt like it. And he was in between jobs, so he had the time to fly and stay with me in New York if he felt like it, which is what happened. Every month or so, we'd fly out to one or the other location and spend a week or so with each other while going on with our lives and allowed us to get to know each other fairly quickly. Within six months, Jeff uh, indicated a willingness to move to New York to live with me and to be in a relationship. The problem was he, he was out of work and he had lived in Detroit his entire 40 years and he wasn't in it family there and he wasn't going to just pick up and move for a, a fling uh, because of those ties. So he wanted to make sure that he was able to find a job in New York that would support him before he moved. And it was the dot-com crash era when there were not a lot of jobs available. Companies had freezes on hiring. And so he started trying in the summer of 2001 to get a job. And it wasn't until the spring of 2002 uh, that, you know, he finally got an offer from a financial institution in New York and moved out to live with me after 14 months of flying back and forth. By that time, we knew we were each serious. We knew we had a lot in common and that we wanted to make a go of it. So that's something that I would suggest to anybody doing this. You need to take time to get to know each other. And when you're not living in the same area, or the same city, you don't have a lot of time together to do that. I don't really think interacting on a video call regularly is quite the same thing as being in each other's presence and being able to touch each other. In the end, we made it as partners for 12 years before deciding there were just too many differences that we were never able to paper over. And because we co-owned our home together, we remained as, as uh, roommates effectively in a large apartment in separate bedrooms for another eight years. Uh, so 20 years in total. So that was a very successful stab on my part. What I would say is that there was one moment in there where it was extremely painful to be separated and we couldn't be together. And that was after 9-11, uh, the bombing of the World Trade Towers. 
We'd gone off on our first vacation together from our separate home locations, meeting in Cyprus in the Mediterranean, and had a wonderful time. I was connected to a woman whose father was the president of the country. We got to stay in the presidential palace. Then we flew back to our respective homes at the end of that trip, and 36 hours later, I was awakened on the morning of 9-11 by a friend saying, turn on your TV, whereupon I began to watch the, the crash and collapse of the two World Trade Towers. Having worked in those buildings and next door to them for a decade or more, having friends who died in, that, in the collapse of the World Trade Towers, I was decimated. New York City was, was a funeral for months after that happened. And I needed and wanted to be with Jeff, my long distance partner at that moment, to hold him, to have him hold me when I was in such pain and he wasn't there. And I would moan at night saying, when are we gonna get together? And he would say, Mike, if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. And he had a, a lot of karmic faith. I didn't, but in the end he was right. He was able to get a job and move to New York and we were together. Now, I wanna add one caveat to all of this. We're now in the era of online dating. And that complicates everything. Most importantly, you don't know if the people that are connecting with you online are real. I would say in the vast majority of cases, I get outreach from people, particularly if they're showing photos that look them, make them look very attractive, that are probably not who they are. And I can quickly tell based on the way they interact with me, the questions they ask, the comments they make. I don't know what they're after, if they're after a sugar daddy, if they're after somebody who will trade the cryptocurrency through them, I don't know. I've spoken to younger people uh, in the same situation and they have the opposite. They have people who offer to be their sugar daddies and to, and to support them. And, but the, the fact is a lot of interest expressed online is not real. And so when I am talking to people, and right now I've got a couple of long distance uh, friends that I'm dealing with, you know, ostensibly with the idea that there may be dating that will come out of it. Uh, one's fairly close in Palm Springs and one is in New York. I live in San Diego. The first thing I do when I meet somebody online and they express an interest, and after we go just a little bit into our conversations about each other, I ask them to arrange a video call. And the quickest determinant of somebody who's not serious or is trying to scam you is somebody who won't show their face. Uh, I wanna see them talk and move and make sure they look like the photos they send me. And then you can begin to assess whether this person is real, what their qualities are, if you have a good fit, and start to maybe travel to see each other and take it from there. It's a very complicated world we live in. Emotions are hard to pin down and hard to figure out. And for two people to share an interest and an attraction and a willingness to commit to each other in this world is pretty much a miracle. But you know what? Because it's so complicated, if you run into somebody you meet online or in passing on, on a trip somewhere and you live in different locations and you hit it off, by all means, explore it. Just be very careful and cautious and thoughtful about the process when you're doing it. This is my take on long distance dating. I hope you have good luck with it. Thank you very much for listening. Mike Balaban for Bammer Talks.